I, I think there are fences uh, in, in, in all spaces and then we start to categorise, you know, who's well off, who's not so well off, who's, you know, um, you know beautiful, who's not, you know, who's you know, intelligent, who's not, who's educated, who's not, who's whatever, who's not, you know, and it starts separating us and, and we're all striving to, to get more, to be more, to advance our careers, to be better, to be whatever it is that we're chasing. But they're, they're, they're so often individual quests. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome to this episode of Better Thinking Podcast. Today, me and Mary Andreas talk about loneliness. We talk about these aspects of what is it, obviously, but those aspects around it actually being a contextual problem in terms of not having anyone around us that we're connected with, but also a psychological aspect of not perceiving that we're connected. It's quite a complex thing because we can often feel lonely and isolated even though we've got lots of people around us. Hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back to Better Thinking Podcast and Mary, welcome back to the podcast So, I think this is our third conversation, is that right? That's right, already three podcasts. It's so quick, it's so quick. What's on the agenda today? So today I thought we could chat a bit about loneliness. Um, this is a, an issue that I feel has become more prevalent in today's society, not just here in Australia, but even globally and there's a number of you know concerns not only for for one's physical health but also one's mental health um so it's it's a really important topic and one that i'm very passionate about as well um so just at the context i thought maybe we could start by defining loneliness um and kind of having a bit of a chat about what's actually meant by that term yeah absolutely i think it's always funny trying to put definitions to two things because it's kind of hard to to understand and know what something is and i suppose that's that's why we probably start there first um i mean being such so kind of um immersed in the act space for me everything and and i mean I think all psychologists appreciate this, but it's it's thoughts and sensations, you know, it's thoughts and, and, and feelings, these experiences that that we have. But if we think about it from from a point of uh, loneliness being a perceived uh, isolation or perceived, um, you know, social uh, um, removal, uh, if I can call that, or dis- distancing. Um, so it's not really actually about uh, how many how many connections someone has, you know, how, how many friends they have, whether they're popular or not. It's actually about whether, how, how someone feels and, and, and thinks about that. So it's not an uncommon thing for someone to feel quite lonely um, when in actual um, fact, everyone outside of them would be saying, wow, they're, they're, you know, really connected, very popular and have so many connections. They might not actually internally be feeling that so i suppose from a definition point of view it's it's you know uh, a feeling of isolation a per, per, you know, perception that one is socially isolated or you know um you know removed from a group there there isn't that strong bond or connection mm. i think that's a really important point that you touched on that it's a perceived sense of isolation rather than um an actual or you know an actual sense of isolation so often when we're alone we're not necessarily feeling lonely. A lot of people are very comfortable in their own, in their own space and in their own company. Um, feeling lonely can come about even if we're surrounded by a group of people. And even if we have lots of friends, it's not necessarily about the number, but about the quality. And it might be that we're on a personal level lacking something in that relationship, whether it's our needs are not being met. Um, our values are perhaps not aligned with um, the experiences that we're sharing with, with the other person so it it's so multifaceted and it's like you said it's just not so clear-cut absolutely and i think that uh when when we talk about loneliness it, it's something that we all feel at some point in our lives or not some in many points in our in our life and and you know there's obviously big uh, degrees of, of loneliness that can be experienced anything from you know i'm missing out and i'm feeling a little bit lonely um to i'm chronically different or you know out of the circle uh you know there's no one that really gets me i'm connected with that that you know i feel close with and 
you know, comfortable around. So there's an, there's an uneasiness, you know, about, you know, being alone, so to speak. Oh, that's exactly spot on. Um, so on that, I think it's important to recognize that, um, there are periods in our life where we can feel lonely and that's quite a normal experience. And often if we're transitioning, maybe from, um, you know, school to university, we're moving houses, we're transitioning perhaps into, into parenthood. Those are all experiences, um, where we may have a sense of loneliness. Um, but there's kind of a distinction as well between experiencing these, you know, as a result of a particular event and then kind of coming out of it and, kind of connecting with with our you know valued friends and family and also that compared to that experience of chronic loneliness and mm. feeling this deep sense of I have nobody and um, there's nobody that I really feel I can connect with um, so on that note I thought maybe we could we just could discuss a little bit about um what contributes to loneliness um, in today's society? Yeah, look, it's a really complex question. Obviously, there's there's so many contributors. Trying to figure out what it specifically is um, is is the million dollar question. Clearly, there's there's lots of lots of contextual uh, contributors. Whether it be um, it could be geographical. Um, uh, limitations. It could be disability. Um, it could be, uh, you know, a personality traits that someone goes out and, and, and is targeted and bullied um, around, or you know, the context of being in a space where you're being bullied. Um, uh, there's, you know, age can can go out and and and, and do that. The, the the contributors are incredibly far and wide you know it can certainly be mental health as well where you know we we know that people who feel depressed or anxious can withdraw it's a very common uh i suppose marker for for feeling um you know depressed depressed or anxious or you know and vice versa if you feel kind of that you're on the outer that can be quite depressing or anxiety provoking too so it's a two-way kind of street so the the um, contributors are, are incredibly, you know, uh, wide and, and span wide and far, uh, and it's not fully a- a- appreciated, you know, specifically what what you know every single mechanism is in, in that. Because once again, that that's kind of like the contextual stuff. Then there's obviously the psychological contextual, which is like our perceived. Um, stuff where there is a chronicity, and this is probably where psychologists psychologists see see this as being something a bit more stuck, you know, of, of, of chronic nature. When there's uh, like a codependence, um, someone's kind of uh, desires and, and and has this urge to be connected so much that they might connect with uh, anyone that, that that that's willing to, and you know, um, and there's problems with limit setting, boundary setting. Um, this is where kind of uh, those challenges come come about, but there's also just this perceived experience of being different, you know, of being on the outer, being less, being not good enough, being an imposter, being uh, whatever deficiency it is, and that's more entrenched, and 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 that's what becomes harder. Where, you know, as we say, uh, as we said earlier, someone can have a lot of people around them, yet they continue to still feel you know um awfully you know lonely and and isolated so there's there, there's a feeling that goes with that there's an experience that goes with that and um it's quite quite awful um uh, i mean i think in, in in some sense that kind of not good enough feeling is probably something most of us have have felt to 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 a degree i imagine that chronic uh isolation and 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 loneliness would be probably, you know, 50-fold, I'm not good enough. You know, it, 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 it must be um, quite quite um, excruciating. But, uh, yeah, I think there's a complexity of, of, of uh, contributors, um, you know, contextual and obviously psychological, um, you know, that, that we perceive. Mm. I think that was a really good point about that kind of bi-directional relationship between our mental health and loneliness because it's often the case um, that when we're feeling depressed, when we're feeling anxious, we tend to withdraw, we tend to feel maybe a bit unmotivated, scared to reach out and to engage with other people. But it also works the other way that um, when we are feeling lonely, when we are lacking those connections, 
um, we start to feel more depressed and more anxious. And it's kind of like this vicious cycle of kind mm-hmm. of like a negative feedback loop where we're, you know, we're feeling, we're feeling sad. So we kind of withdraw and then we withdraw. So we're feeling sadder and even more isolated because we're not reaching out to people. And, you know, it's, it's a really, um, terrible experience for for these kinds of people, and it also builds you know really strong networks of of beliefs. You know that that goes out and collects evidence. You know where where we say I am lonely and I am isolated, and I've got plenty of evidence. You know to to support that, and so you know a belief system then takes hold, and we act on those belief systems. So even when there are opportunities to potentially um, uh, try and connect. Uh, we might, you know, perceive that uh, 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 it's either not worth it, or if we do connect, that the person actually isn't connecting with us, and 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 they don't, you know, um, want to really be a friend or whatever it might be. So that that's a that chronicity that 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 we talk about, which is really really hard because if it is a if it's more grounded in the perceived um, side, uh, then obviously that. Um, you know, core belief and the core experience, those core feelings are, are, are a bit more embedded, you know, in, in, in entrenched than kind of conditional isolation. But obviously, you know, long-term conditional isolation can, can create those belief systems too. That's exactly right. Um, so the, the statistics for loneliness um, over the last few years – appear to kind of be increasing in a way. So um, at this point, I think there was a recent uh, survey conducted, I think it was at Swinburne, um, where they found that one in four adults are feeling lonely. One in four Australian adults are feeling lonely. One in two are feeling lonely for at least one day in a week. And over half are feeling lonely at least sometimes. Um, So that's quite staggering statistics and it's really sad and disheartening to to feel that a lot of people are are living with this experience in such a a chronic and persistent way um i'm wondering if um there's anything perhaps about today's society um in general whether it's social media or, or work culture or anything that um might be contributing to this sense of isolation it's it, it's a fascinating question and i've I, I always think about it and it's something that kind of i raise quite commonly you know in, in in my work and in my thoughts and around dinner tables um of this kind of uh sort of individualistic society or a collective sort of uh, a society and i wonder if if in this sort of more collective society there are lower rates of of um loneliness and i i don't i don't have the data i'm just kind of wondering whether whether that's uh, still there because loneliness still has that 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 uh that aspect of it it's perceived so even even if we were to say you know let's go out and 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 uh create more opportunities i'm not sure whether that would necessarily go out and and and, and you know um, improve the numbers of of you know people feeling connected. Uh, so it's, it's really hard, and I, I I'd have to think at least logic tells me that there are certain things about society that that does you know lean a little bit towards you know increased uh, rates of loneliness. Um, and you know it's very much in in the way that a modern world works. I mean the fact that we've got these uh, boundaries around our homes is quite a an interesting idea you know that we put fences that uh, and I, I i i get it you know delineates where my land is versus your land um you know of this kind of possessive possession based you know materialistic world uh, but obviously the moment we've got a fence there uh, it puts puts a barrier between you and i and so when we do that um uh, uh, upon an infinite number of, of, of categories, I, I think there are fences uh, in, in, in all spaces. And then we start to categorize, you know, who's well off, who's not so well off, who's, you know, um, 
you know, beautiful, who's not, you know, who's you know, intelligent, who's not, who's educated, who's not, who's whatever, who's not, you know, and it starts separating us and, and we're all striving to, to get more, to be more, to advance our careers, to be better, to be whatever it is that we're chasing. But they're, they're, they're so often individual quests. Maybe some of this is biologically driven as well. I mean, if I don't look at myself as an individual, um, uh, may, maybe potentially, um, you know, my, my, my lifespan could kind of reduce because I'm not looking after myself. But you could probably run the same argument in, in the other direction and say, well, if I'm not looking after my tribe, my lifespan will go down. So I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I wish I had the answer. Um, I'd have to assume if the numbers are going up, there's something that we're doing that we can't necessarily put our put our finger on but you know obviously social media always you know uh, is 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 called upon to to explain things i'm not sure because i the readings that i have looked at is social media can be highly isolating and it can be highly engaging and and and, and be used to to connect people and i don't know if the verdict is out yet um i haven't seen any research to to, to date uh, but i think um our world's you know ask us to to continually put these fences up at least that, that that's the way that i look at it and and so as we become more and more advanced technologically it just appears as though um there are there are aspects there are tides that keep drawing us to be you know individualistic you know and, and it might might start as you know i'm going to i know uh, uh uh, give myself a spike, you know, when I'm growing up, and put put some gel in my hair, and if I've got a really cool spike, and you know, I can run fast, I'm I'm individually different or better. But when when you start to categorise it too far, you start to also then go, well, I'm not that, and I'm not that, and I'm not that. Therefore, I'm different. I'm potentially on the outer. Um, I'm not feeling included. I'm feeling excluded. So complex. I don't know. Well, do you have any thoughts about? some of those contributors if, if we had to throw some some ideas at it <laughs> um i definitely agree there's is a lot of complexity and it's not so black and white uh but i i did like that point about that sort of individual individualistic versus kind of collective cultures and just kind of a way of way of being and um um as you were kind of talking about that i thought about um back i mean i, I think loneliness has a kind of like a biological cause to it as well. I mean, back back in the days when, you know, we were hunter-gatherers or cavemen or whatever we refer them to as, um, we depended on, on each other for survival, really. So we had to live in tribes to, to build things, to collect food, to hunt animals. And if we were alone, if we found ourselves excluded from that tribe, um, there's a very good reason why we start to feel anxious and sad and scared and you know that you know back then it was a matter of really life and death and although you know it might not necessarily be a matter of life and death in today's society there's still a number of issues that can come from isolation that really kind of stems back to to the way we are as humans as social beings that that are you know kind of designed to interact with each other um and it, it does call into question um, the the kind of nature of this individualistic society, where, as you mentioned, we're kind of um, kind of poised, I suppose, to look after ourselves and um, kind of, I guess, have our own best interest in mind. So that, that definitely might be a contributor. It's interesting, also, in that you know, back in the you know caveman days so to speak uh, obviously getting kicked out of the tribe as you say goes out mm. and means your your life expectancy goes down quite quite rapidly and in some sense that the, the data is true even today that if you are isolated um I, i've read that it's equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day yeah. um, now where that number came from god knows but um, <laughs> it, 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 it tells us that our life expectancy does go down and and you yeah. know it, it makes sense because if if you are truly isolated, it, it, it means that when you're sick, no one's there to go out and, and, and assist or help, um, like what our nursing staff would do in hospital. 
well, our family, our friends, you know, people we know would do that at our homes. Um, sometimes it might be that someone's stubborn. They don't want to go to hospital, but having people around, they're saying, come on, off you go. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow you to, to be, you know, uh, stubborn and, and and not go. It sounds like it might be pneumonia or something. And they're like, no, no, it's just a, it's just a mild cough or something. Mm. It all helps having extra hands around the house. You know, we we see farmers, for example, who who unfortunately, you know, have have accidents where, when they're alone, and you know, it's not that the accident kills them; it's the bleeding out that kills them, or um, it, it's the fact that they're trapped for extended period of time, and you know, there are further you know, injuries that, that, that occur or whatever it might, might be, you know, encouragement, you know, to, to get the best out of each other, different, different perceptions that, that, you know, others will provide support. So isolation, you know, uh, goes out and reduces our, um, uh, lifespan. I just don't know how connected isolation and loneliness is though. And that, that, that's what's so complex about this is the, is this space between isolation and 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 you know chronic loneliness and so it, it's really hard when working when I kind of reflect working with with clients so often I encourage how can we go out and and you know increase that breadth of social connection but it doesn't always necessarily um, you know stem to that this belief work that needs to be done um you know there's acceptance work that needs to be done you know, with, with regards to sitting with feelings and so on and so forth and we'll probably touch on that in a moment but uh it, it it's complex it, it's complex because you know we we do have uh, uh poorer outcomes by by the the um moderating factor or mediating factor of, of, of isolation and maybe that also is a factor of, of feeling lonely because lonely loneliness might mean that we're withdrawn and we don't connect as much. Mm, I find it fascinating that this perceived lack of connection, this loneliness, um, can actually contribute to physical health issues. I mean, that, that blows my mind and like you mentioned, it, it might be a matter of, you know, being kicked out of the tribe if we don't have people to look after us, um, you know, we're, we're more likely to, to suffer from these physical health issues. But um, the, there's some research out there that even um, kind of suggests that um, people who are lonely are more susceptible to even, you know, they have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, yeah. cancer, even just uh, mortality, which is mind-blowing. So it really, it really emphasises how critical this this issue is well it's a huge issue because isolation or or perceived you know isolation loneliness increases our fight or flight which means we're we're running on a cortisol um you know diet so to speak we've got a higher adrenal response and doing that over an extended period of time will give you you know increased heart disease you know like type a personalities have greater heart, heart disease because they go 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 um Hence, why I get my heart checked uh, uh, annually. <clears throat> um, but but we see that when you're running on cortisol, there's obviously going to be problems, and that's going to branch out to not only, you know, things like uh, you know, heart disease and cancer, but you know, the whole lot because we we know that's how it works, and hence why doctors don't willy nilly give out cortisol because it's not necessarily a, a great drug, you know, to be just pumping in. We want to do it medicinally um and when we've got plenty of it we're anxious if we're depressed our immune system goes down you know all, all these things are just so interrelated so from from purely a base level you know greater cortisol that's an extended period of time that's chronic you'll get sicker more often you'll oh. you'll you'll be um you know more susceptible to to, to to illness and obviously over a over a lifetime um you know if you expected Age is, 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 I think, I don't know, uh, mid, low, low 80s, you know, low to mid 80s, you know, if we put men and women together. Um, well, you might be one of the earlier ones if, if you're lonely um, and not just because of accident like what we mentioned before, but, you know, of, of all the other things that we, we, it's just hard to correlate these things or not correlate, my apologies, to, to create causation. We, we, we can't do that. Um, hence why statistics are so powerful to say, wow, this, this actually does occur. Uh, we can't give a exact reasoning, um, but you know, 
clearly we know people who are highly stressed all the time and, and certainly you know chronic loneliness would be highly stressing yeah definitely um and i suppose feeling lonely as well might lead us to engage in behaviors like withdrawal or, or you know that that may not necessarily be helpful but it's when we're in that state we can't really see a way out out of it um that's within our our control and that kind of goes back to i suppose limiting beliefs um, um as we were chatting I, I thought about um the the rat park experiment and how that kind of does tie into into that experience of loneliness and sort of behaviors that behaviors that stem from those feelings of isolation i thought maybe we could um we could chat a bit about that because it's a it's a really fascinating study yeah absolutely um, you might have to correct me here and there, so to, I'll have to jog, jog my memory a bit. Um, but the Rat Park uh, uh, experiment, I think, is most famous for uh, how it's gone out and explained this connection with uh, drug use um, and, in, in particular, choices that, that uh, rats make um, in particular contexts. And so the Rat Park experiment, um, and please jump in at any time so I don't mm-hmm. mess it up for our listeners. <clears throat> but uh, uh, the the idea of heroin being wildly addictive, um, you know, had, had, it came from some some experiments where a rat was placed in a in a box in isolation, given two choices of um, uh, water: one which was clean water, and one that was um, water mixed with heroin, uh, and also a little bit of uh, uh, sugar um, because it doesn't taste very good; uh, it's very bitter um, otherwise. And so the the rat was able to go out and choose from either um, uh, either water, water or heroin. Um, and obviously, being an inquisitive um, creature, very similar to human beings, um, it tried from both. But uh, what what the researcher found is that um, once it tasted sort of both, and in in, in those sort of conditions, it would pretty well um, exclusively start taking. Um, uh, the heroin water, you know, only, and so from that came this this amazing revelation that you know, do not go out and ever try heroin even once. Try it once, you're addicted for life. And it's like, wow, that's groundbreaking stuff. You know, let's let's give Nobel Peace Prize for that. that, that that's amazing. But some years later, um, uh, experimenters reviewed um, that, which is what all good science does, and um, you know, thankfully. Uh, you know, psychologists, scientists, practitioner driven, you review this sort of stuff, you look at it again and, and, and you look at, you know, what are the, the functional forces. And so the experiment was, was, was revisited, um, uh, except that uh, they started to look at changing some of the, the variations. And what, what they found is that um, if a rat was left in isolation, um, and it was addicted, and then it was placed back into uh, a group of rats. And, and so the group of rats, this is an experiment called Rat Park. Um, the group of rats meant that they'd all be together, and rather than being a little box, um, the park where all the rats were together, um, you know, the rats could have a good old time. They could, you know, socialize, they could have sex, they could go out and have meaning and create hierarchy and go through mazes and there were activities, there were places to hide, they were, you know, others to, to wrestle with. So it was, it was dubbed the rat park. It was an enjoyable space. So after a, a rat was, you know, quote unquote, addicted by putting it into a social, into a isolated, you know, box and given uh, water and heroin water, and obviously we choose the heroin water. The experimenters put the rat back into the rat park, um, and it was given the opportunity to uh, choose from uh, water and heroin water. And uh, it, it started well; it chose the the water, um, and so big sort of light bulb moment of what the hell? What well, what's going on here? Is isn't this like a you know a, a physiological you know, addiction and, and the truth is, yes, it is a physiological addiction. Uh, having said that, the rat was willing to go through withdrawals and all those other awful things once it was in that, in the condition of social connectivity and bonding and, and you know, playing and, and, and meaning and purpose and so on and so forth. Um, now, the experimenters did some 
interesting things by, for example, getting the whole rat park to only have heroin water so that all of them became um, drug addicted, so to speak. And then they gave them choice days of, uh, you know, having water or heroin water on a particular day. And, and they observed that even in that condition, when the whole group was, was, was like that, um, they, they, the uh, rats would start to drink from the water, uh, even though they start to observe uh, uh, consistent symptoms of withdrawal, of shaking and the like. So this, this idea of heroin is addictive uh, uh, is still in, in, in so many ways um, true that there is that biological um, uh, um, need when you're, when you're going out and take it. But po- post that, it's, it, it's the, the idea, the appreciation, understanding that this research goes out and, and talks about is that um, it's a social, it's, it, it's highly... The, the, for, the functioning force of this is quite social, um, is that if, they, if someone is bonded and they've got all those things, social networks, uh, meaning, purpose, playfulness, hierarchies, you know, I'm assuming uh, advice, encouragement, um, kind of connectivity, that heroin doesn't go out and, and play, play its role. Um, and I think uh, uh, wonderful... Um, I think as a journalist, uh, Johan Haris talks about it in a, in a particular way where he said that during the same time as the Rat Park experiment was going on, the greatest you know, socialist experiment was, was, was occurring with, with the Vietnam War. And you know, uh, if you know a little bit about that, there was a lot of um, uh, opioid use uh, among soldiers in that time. And you know, when, when you kind of think about it, why wouldn't they? Um, if you're in awful conditions, away from you know family, away from the, the, those friends. Although you got camaraderie and the rest of it, but you're now in a space where you're you know knee deep in mud and it's hot and stinky and people are shooting at you and you're not eating very well and you're not sure if you're going to survive and you've seen you know uh, your uh, colleagues being shot, um, dying, disease, people getting sick. Um, under those conditions, why wouldn't you have a little bit of respite and take some, some um, you know, opioids and, 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 and smoke that? So the, 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 this idea of we're going to um, end the war and all of a sudden you know, a couple hundred thousand soldiers are going to come home. Uh, you know, what are we going to do with all of them? You know, we're, we're expecting that they're, they're all going to be drug addicted. What, how, how do you do this? You know, this is going to be a catastrophe. Um, and they found that you know, the absolute vast majority returned and, and, and they didn't have those drug problems. Um, why? Because they returned back into the rat park. Um, mm-hmm. So the, the, this is powerful, powerful stuff around, around what loneliness goes out and does, the choices that we make when we're alone. Um, and, and clearly loneliness means that we start making um, yeah, poor choices uh, when, when, when we look at life outcomes. Uh, and that's exactly what what the rats demonstrated and um, there's been some fascinating uh, social policies that have come out of that um, in you know, countries around the world. Um, but I think that social policy stems to, to many things, not just drugs. Isn't it um, just incredible the effects that just our, our environment and our perceived um, lack or, you know, like our connection really can have on, on just our our choices and the way that we're feeling and what we venture out and actually do. And um, I, I love that experiment because it, it really just just um, proves that our environment has a, a massive impact and it's not all that, you know, maybe we just have this, you know, this mental illness or this thing that's wrong with us that it's just, it's just us and that we can't really do anything to fix it. It's that the things that our social environment plays a massive role a massive role in in the way that we're feeling and and our, our connectedness with other people um and i guess in today's society um the and we, we can kind of chat about um factors that that might be um kind of exacerbating our, our sense of perceived isolation and um I, I wonder a bit about and we kind of touched on it before about the individualistic cultures but even um i feel that today's society is very kind of 
work driven as well and you're kind of perceived as lazy if you're going part-time or you may be taking some time off um but it's really um there's a, a lot of emphasis on kind of go 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 and you know working you know more than nine to five in, in a lot of jobs and and now we're kind of you know expected a lot of the times to take our laptops home to check our emails and it's kind of taking away i suppose um that leisure time where we can spend with our, our friends and family and um thought maybe i could get your thoughts on that and whether, whether that might be a contributor in some sense i think the once again there's complexity in that because we also know how important it is for people to be highly active. Um, mm. And so, you know, that, that, that's actually one of the, you know, Rat Park experiments as well, that we, we, where you've got high activity, um, not high activity, we, we've got lots of activity, engagement and, and, and so on, you know, that, 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 that's a, um, you know, improvement in health uh, and the like. And so there's so much about what we do in, in, in society that that's highly health promoting. And one of those is being engaged. Um, but we know that there's a tipping point for 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 everything. So if we look at you know mental health, um, you know being engaged. You know, uh, let, let's talk about activity for a quick quick moment. Often psychologists will talk about uh, this idea of going out and getting exercise, or at least the GP will. Uh, that's not actually valid if we pull it apart. And I'm not suggesting that exercise doesn't help, but it's it's actually uh, being active. That helps. And so children will never go out and require exercise. We don't go and say, just jump on this this treadmill and do exercise because they're engaged, right? They're, they're crawling under things, they're climbing on things, they're jumping off things, you know, rather than walking, they're running. They're kind of constantly engaged. And, and when we make someone sedentary, uh, if we look at the mental health data it goes out and, and and starts demonstrating that people start getting depressed they start getting uh you know low in mood there's all sorts of complications that come from that um so being sedentary is is um awful on the flip side someone being overly active uh where it's go 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 without rest is highly problematic as well, you know, and, and, and this is where we would common, commonly see more anxiety where someone doesn't have an opportunity to rest. Um, and so we can look at it in, in, in so many contexts. You know, you, you go out and you put a rat, uh, you put a sock over a rat, you leave its head out, so it loses its mobility, it gets depressed. Right, um, because it, it, that's, that's a really crap life to go out and, you know, be able to eat, drink, but you can't move. Right, that that's going to be highly depressing. And 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 you know, we also see when 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 someone you know, has an awful accident or something, and they become quadriplegic or something. They, they, it's often strongly correlated with being depressed. No no uh, surprises there. Similarly, if you go out and put a rat on a spinning wheel. Uh, and it can't get out of the spinning wheel and you spin it and you spin it and you spin it and you spin it. How do you think it feels? Um, and so this, this uh, factor needs to be kind of looked at. And so we, we see that there are the, 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 these functional um, uh, moderators or, or, or forces that go out and, and create, create you know, uh, someone being unwell. And we can look at it from sleep, for example. Um, we can look at it from... Uh, uh, hostile environments, so where someone's being, you know, um, criticised or bullied, um, you know, attacked all the time. Uh, a lack of meaning will do a similar sort of thing, you know, where there's no meaning, there's no purpose, there's no drive, there's nothing to to, to aim for. Um, social isolation, that's massive, you know, that that we don't have meaningful, engaged, um, uh, you know, warm warm connections oh. all those things are there the big thing with social isolation is it's perceived you know what one of those factors uh, so it's very easy to see when it's not a perceived thing um and we say okay well that's contextual because um you know you've gone for a trip to um japan and you're in tokyo and you don't know the language and there's no one to really connect with. It's going to be really, really hard to, to connect. You're only there for, for, for three weeks. So you're not going to pick up the language. You know, it's like, well, okay, contextually, maybe we need to go to a backpackers where there might be other, you know, English speakers and you might be able to kind of not be so lonely. Okay, that's contextual. We can kind of see that. That's nice and easy. But if the context is 
a perceived, you know, internal um, loneliness. Uh, at that point, we're in a different world because it, it effectively says, go to the backpackers, but it still doesn't cut it. Mm-hmm. And this is that belief system sort of space, um, you know, and, and how we interpret our sensations and our feelings and how we sit with sensations and feelings and, and, and you know, how we buy into thoughts that, you know, I'm not connected to people are not close to them and I'm not close to them. And, and, and then obviously the behaviour that that uh, elicits from us or encourages us to do, which might be withdraw or not be vulnerable, um, you know, and, and chronicity in that often also means that we haven't practised those skills. Um, and so if you haven't practised those skills very well uh, or very much, it's harder to do small talk. It's harder to kind of, you know, ask questions about someone and be, you know, genuinely curious and engaged, you know, become something that you're actively trying to do rather than just doing, you know, by, by virtue of being. So the, 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 the internal, you know, uh, struggle is much greater um, than contextual. Um, and we know that as psychologists because, uh, if, if it was a matter of context, we would so easily just encourage our clients to shift the context um, and they would feel, you know, 100 times better. Uh, but, uh, you know, our work is, is, is much longer and deeper and needs to venture into, you know, harder, harder spaces because this stuff's, you know, entrenched, ingrained um, and it's not easily... Um, uh, uh, sort of navigated through as well. I, I wonder if um, that, that kind of, um, that's sort of similar to the way in which we use social media as well. So it might not necessarily be that, you know, although social media is often, you know, quick to get the blame for, you know, we're all lonely because of the spike in social media. It might not, not necessarily be the fact that social media exists or even that we're using it. It might be maybe the, the way in which we're using it and the beliefs we have around that. So if, if we're using social media um, to supplement our, our you know, face-to-face or real-life friendships, you know, quote-unquote, um, it might actually be uh, a really useful tool to keep in touch while someone's overseas or while you're not able to see them, you know, every single day face-to-face and kind of find out a bit about what's going on with them. Um, but if we're using it to, uh, exclusively for our social interactions and we believe that we are just incapable of having those face-to-face interactions and those real-life interactions um, in the you know, ex- external environment, um, I suppose that's where it might be problematic. Yeah, it's a it's a sense of belonging, and and you know people going out and, and using whether it be social media or, or, or in any sort of um, uh, technology, it does take away a little bit from it. I mean, uh, at the moment, you and I are speaking, but we're not in the same room, and no matter no matter how we, how we cut it, it's just not the same, right? You know, if if, if we were in the same room, there would be so much more, you know for whatever reason, warmth and appreciation, understanding and connectedness and all, all, all those all those things. And um, by virtue of it being through a screen and being through these mics, for, for whatever reason, it changes it. So the, it takes away kind of that element of, of um, you know, belongingness, connectedness, uh, even though, you know, we, we can talk about also being a perceptive thing. It's also an experiential thing. Um, and, and we know that if someone is um, uh, uh, you know, on the other side of the world, and we talk over Skype or something, it's just not the same. And, and interestingly, even if even if they're in the next suburb, it's just not the same. You know, and this is why the phone will never cut it for people who, uh, you know, are in a courting and and wanting to fall in love. They don't just say, "Oh, let's just keep chatting on the phone." No, they say, "To hell with the phone. When are we meeting up?" Right. Yes, it is nice that we can talk on the phone late at night because we can't be meeting up at night because our parents won't let us out at night. So let's chat and chat and chat. Um, that that's kind of great. But when's the next moment we can, you know, meet, connect, touch, you know, hug, kiss, whatever it is, um, you know, because they they're so important. So, you know, I think social media technology has uh, you know a lot of amazing, amazing, beautiful things about it, and at the same time. I, mean, I think it's fairly fairly um, obvious uh, that 
it does also have an effect if that's where we're spending a fair bit of fair bit of time. Having said that, if someone's chronically lonely, uh, it might actually be the the most amazing tool because how else do they go out and and connect if they're not brave enough, confident enough to reach out at, at, at this physical level because that's just all you know over consuming, you know anxiety provoking and so on. You know maybe they can do that world so much better and easier by virtue of technology, you know, and we see young people in particular playing games that they can talk. Uh, I, mean, I used to play, you know, the Atari and, um, you know, Commodore 64 and, and uh, Sega Master System. Um, and they would be kind of social, sorry, um, uh, uh, individual games. These days, when you play, you play as a team, you play with, with people all around, all around the world, you know each other's names, you can have your own personas in how you build your characters, you're talking in real time. My God, there, there, there's so much that um, you know, uh, young and old people get out of gaming these days. And you know, there, there's an, a perfect example of how people can connect um, and not feel you know, isolated. And you know, th- th- there's these niche groups that are probably really hard to, to find you know, otherwise. So yeah, I don't know. I, th- I think there's probably a little bit in each camp, and maybe that's because you know we're we're complex, and you know it's very hard to talk about everyone um, because everyone's not not part of the same statistic. You know, of, of this is how you will be as part of that statistic. You're an individual still. That's right, and it, it really is just a case by case basis. And um, although a lot of us can relate to the experience of loneliness, and perhaps some of us to even that experience of chronic loneliness, our reasons for it can can differ so so widely. Um, so on that note, and although it is quite a difficult question, considering everyone is so different and so unique, is there anything we can do on on a personal level or even on a societal level to deal with loneliness? Two things that come to, to mind for me is, is uh, you know, ripping down the fences, you know, where we, we, we engage as much as possible, connect with people, um, be involved. Uh, and when I say that, I, I, I still consider that in line with your natural makeup um, or even if it's a touch more than your natural makeup. So um, if, if, if that's a helpful um, scenario. Uh, so I think the more touch points we've got, the, the, the more likely it is that we can feel you know, engaged, um, connected, um, you know, as part of a collective rather than isolated. So the, the more things that we're involved in, maybe there's a probability of, of you know, feeling more, more um, involved and as part of, part of the um, you know, community. But we also need to go out and address the psychological component, which is the you know that perceived you know space, and that's where I think what we can do is really look at you know the the ideas that we've uh, adopted or our thoughts about who we are, whether we're connected or not, if we're good enough or not, you know the self esteem type type questions, uh, and and that's kind of hard to do by yourself. So you know and you know. Of course, you and I are going to be highly um, biased. So, you know, we'll, we'll say talk to a psychologist, you know, or, or someone. And it doesn't actually need to, to be that. It could be actually just talking to, to anyone and just saying, I'm feeling kind of on the outer. I'm feeling isolated. I don't feel like I fit in as much. Um, it's really, really hard stuff. Um, but I, I think trying to table it and making it part of a conversation makes it less scary. And we often find out that, so many other people are uh, in the same boat, you know, and, 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 you know, by virtue even of that, of that, uh, you know, saying, or when we think about it, metaphor, um, you know, it means, oh, there's other people in the same boat. So I'm, I'm not by myself, you know, uh, and that, that can sometimes help to, to, to understand that, you know, I'm not alone. Uh, but obviously the, it, 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 there, there will still often be, uh, that incongruency effect where someone will say, but I am your friend um, and, and it'll be sure, but this, this feeling inside and the thoughts are not going out and saying that, you know, that they are saying that and they're not saying that, you know, and so until something is congruent, it's really hard to live with. Um, and, and, you know, I think therapy helps us either to assist with creating congruency or living with it 
when there can't be congruency or we haven't found a way of, of, of finding congruency. So for, for a lot of us, we won't find congruency and that's normal and that's expected. Uh, and for some, we might find a little bit more congruency um, or, you know, in, in, in particular cases, maybe full congruency. Uh, but they're, they're the two spaces that I would, I would you know, focus on in terms of, you know, what people can go out and, 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 and kind of do to try and, feel a little bit more connected and, and, and um, as, as part of, you know, whether it be a full community or even just a small bunch of, you know, friends or even a workplace. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter what that group is uh, because, you know, as you, you, you wisely said earlier, this isn't about quantity. It, it's about quality. And, and, and that's what we're trying to do with congruency. We're kind of saying, you know, most people only need, you know, one other person. Um, thankfully, a lot of us have more than just one person. You know, we might have that through, you know, a, a, um, a partner, a spouse. Um, we often have that through family, maybe even uh, siblings, um, you know, parents. Uh, you know, if, if, if we're fortunate, um, then obviously friendships. Maybe we've made them through through schooling, um, you know, university, work, um, sport music, hobbies, interests. Yeah, uh, so the, they're the sorts of places that we kind of, you know, try and try move into. But it's not about being, you know, highly extroverted and you know, having a, you know, 600 friends and so on and so forth. You know, quality is, quality is important, but it still doesn't address congruency. So I think that that's where psychology fits and, and, and you know, can be highly um, useful to, to, to talk with a professional as well. Um, if someone's really struggling. Yeah, that's right. I think it's really, really quite easy, um, you know, when people are feeling lonely to say, well, just reach out to, to someone, talk to someone about it. But um, that's often the worst advice you could give someone because they're sitting there screaming, I don't have anyone I can talk to about this. So who am I supposed to chat to about it? So um, I think those are some some really useful points and um also from from the other side from a societal side um if you're fortunate enough to be in a position where you're not feeling so lonely or even if you are it, it doesn't hurt to spark up a conversation with your neighbor um you know we're we're often so wrapped up in you know our own kind of worlds and you know wrapped up in, in what we're going to be doing next that we we kind of lose small little opportunities just here and there to to have those idle chats you know um if we're on the train and now our heads down the entire time, you know, buried in our mobile phone, we often lose that that opportunity to even just make eye contact and smile with the stranger. Um, and you know, while that not may not necessarily solve the loneliness issue, um, it can be a really nice experience to have, and it can kind of, you know, in some ways, just even for the everyday person, decrease that sense of isolation um, or perceived isolation. So I think it's really important for um, if, if we are in a position where we can, um, you know, where we, we feel capable enough or confident enough or whatever it may be to reach out to others, to invite someone that maybe you don't necessarily invite out all the time, invite them along to the bar you're going to on the weekend or to a coffee or spark up a conversation with your colleague at work or, you know, someone at university who you sit with that you, you rarely ever speak to. I think these, you know, small acts of kindness um, can really be quite important and, and might even lead to a relationship or a friendship of some sort. You, you really never know, but um, it's, it's a place to start, I suppose. And that's part of the, the challenge is that, you know, we're not often going to feel very confident, you know, in, in doing so when we're feeling that way, you know, and, and, and having to kind of muster up a little bit of courage or, you know, Bravery uh, is probably what's going to take, you know. So, you know, uh, being courageous while being scared, uh, uh, you know, having having both of those experiences going on at the same same time is is might be just exactly what what we need to go out and, and and do at least to take that first step. So, I think yeah, you you nailed that quite quite lovely. Yeah, and and it's not necessarily that you know by doing this we might find ourselves in this whole massive group of friends, but it might just be an opportunity to to begin. It might just be that first step to begin that that sense of connection and that that friendship or that whatever it is. So um, yeah, but um, obviously it's 
it's not easy by any means and it might take some time. Um, but I think those are, are really nice places to, to start. And, and like you said, also yeah. to, to have that conversation, to make it less taboo to talk about these things because those statistics show that it's really, you know, you're not alone in your loneliness, as, as funny as that sounds. Um, there's lots of people out there who are likely feeling the same way that, that you are. And, you know, often we're, we're kind of too scared to talk about it because, you know, if, we're lonely if we don't have friends, if we don't have relationships that are meaningful to us and there's something wrong with us or we're a loser. And it's just not the case at all. So by, you know, breaking down that stigma and making it more, um, making it more common to have those conversations, um, I think it can be really, really useful. Absolutely. I'm feeling pretty good that we've uh, solved the world of uh, <laughs> Lovely talking, Mary, uh, as as usual, um, and and I think I think this is an ongoing conversation and 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 needs to be discussed and and tabled and you know I think we're all vulnerable to it. Um, cool. I think we've all experienced it, uh, different forms and times. Um, but uh, let's keep tabling these these, these uh, topics and and you know ridding the world of all all loneliness and whatever else that it comes <laughs> and all of its problems. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much, Nish. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. So thank you for that. And great talking. Thanks, Mary. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources and just lastly if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team develop your experience and get into some exciting work come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out i'd love to hear from you <music>